One of the saddest stories in the history of the Christian church begins with the very best of intentions. There are two guys named Stone and Campbell uh, back in what we now call the Second Great Awakening, that time period between 1790 and 1840, when uh, there were revivals going all across the land. That is the time when America became, became a land of Christians as that sort of revivalistic, revivalistic fervor caught fire. And these two guys, uh, and they're both in two different places, Stone and Campbell, they uh, both started sort of movements, church movements. They wanted to bring all the churches together. They wanted to get rid of all the denominations and just have church, one church for America. Right? They, what they, according to what they saw, both of them came to the same conclusion that all of this stuff that was uh, after the first century was just, that's what divided us. And so if we got rid of all of the things after the first century and we just got back to um, what the New Testament said, that we could just all get along. And we would just do what the New Testament said, only baptize adults upon confession of faith, have a biblical model of leadership, have independent churches just like the churches were that Paul was writing to. And uh, if the Bible says something, we have an opinion. If not, the Bible doesn't say anything, then we don't have an opinion. And, and just, everyone can agree on that. And, and these two guys, Campbell and Stone, they found each other, and they realized that they were in agreement about this, so they shook hands on it, they joined the two churches, and I I'm sure that they thought that this was now going to happen again and again and again. That churches were just going to listen to what they had to say and say, you're right. I don't want to be Presbyterian anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to hook up with you. I don't want to be Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic. We're going to ditch all that. We're just going to join your church and just be church, right? Well, you can guess that that's not exactly what happened. Different traditions, different churches would hear this and say, well, what about this? Or what about that? Presbyterians could point out, well, presbyters are in the Bible. What about them? You don't have those. Our Catholics would point and say, well, uh, Peter, upon the rock upon which the church is built, that, that's the Pope, right? We're, what, we can't ditch that. And so uh, the churches did not all jump on board. And, and so the dark irony is that the, the movement that began to end all denominations ended up as a denomination. Right? And then it split. That's the sad part. The, 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 the church that began to end all denominations became a denomination that splits itself, and now they're called Churches of Christ and Disciples of Christ. That's where those churches come from. So why can't we just get along? Why do we disagree about so much? Why uh, wouldn't the world be better if there was just one church and, and there was the church in Kirksville and the church in Green City and the church in Milan and the church in Trenton, just one church per town and that was that? Wouldn't that be nice? And at least if we can't all uh, join, couldn't we get along just a little bit better? Right. Well, I'm going to give you the two reasons that uh, the church Christians can't just get along. One reason is the long reason and one reason is real short. I'll give you the long reason first. The long reason begins with a deceptively simple question. How does authority work? How does authority work? Let's say you go to your mama, an authority figure, and say, Mama, I'd like to learn how to cook. And, and your mama teaches you how to cook, if she's the authority, right? If your mama teaches you how to cook, do you cook every dish the exact same way your mama cook it and never, never vary it? That's the authority, right? She told you. Or, do you, your, your mama teaches you how to cook and you say, well, that's good, but let me experiment. I'll use what you taught me and I'll, I'll play with it. Or, do you say, you know what, mama, you taught me to cook what's tasty. You cook one way. I think this is tasty, so I'll cook this way. Right? You can see that uh, all three of those, you can argue different ways of authority. Authority is something that tells you exactly what to do. Or authority is something that shapes how you go forward. And authority, you can look at authority and say, well, I'll value what it values. I, I run into people that they cook that pot roast the exact same way their mama cooked it because that's what their mama told them. My mama's pot roast, right? I run into people who uh, have discovered that if you dump a bottle of A1 in that pot roast, that that spices up, up quite a bit, right? So I cook my mama's pot roast, but I kind of play with it. And then I know people who say, you know what, that's, that pot roast is okay, but I like steak. And so they cook steak, right? All, all three that my mama taught me to cook, and, and, but authority comes in different flavors, right? That's kind of an easygoing example of how authority works. Let me give you a little bit more tense version. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says women should be silent in church. 
Yep, women should be silent in church. Now, authority, right? That's the Bible. It says, all y'all women, no more words. You are not to say anything else in church. Just zip it, that's it. No more talking when you're in this building. Authority. You could also say, another way of understanding authority, that Paul is just leaning towards men speaking first. So, y'all women, you can talk after I've talked. <laughs> And other men, leaders, right? Men first. Uh, or there's a third way of viewing this. Authority, uh, seeing what Paul valued, or Peter, uh, Paul valued in saying, Paul's talking about wanting to have there to be organization and peace in worship, and Paul is telling those who are disrupting worship to be quiet, and in that church it happened to be a group of women. And so you could say that anyone who's disrupting worship, I would probably say, please chill. Right? Now you can guess where I stand on this. All right, I stand on that last part, but there are people who are as equally committed to following Jesus as anyone here who believe those first two. That women should not talk in church, or that men should all do all the talking first, and women you can like back clean up. And that all, that all based upon the same authority, right? We're all just preaching the Bible. That's what the Bible says. Paul says women shouldn't talk in church, right? It, you, we can go through the Bible and pick passage after passage after passage, and how you understand it as authoritative changes everything, right? It, when Jesus says, eat this meal in remembrance of me, what meal is he eating? Passover. And so every time we come to communion, do we need to have the full Passover meal to do what Jesus said? Or do we need to have unleavened bread, because that's the bread that Jesus had? Or do we need to have the bread that, the unleavened bread Jesus was eating was the common bread of the day, so do we need to eat the common bread of our day, which is white bread, right? And, and so different ways to understand authority. And that's just talking about the Bible. It gets even more enjoyable after this. Uh, when you start talking about authority, there are some churches who understand authority and if you ask, let's say a Baptist church. Yes, the Baptist church, describe what authority for the church means. They would say, this is red box, right? Let's call these the Bible. Authority in the church is entirely based on the Bible. And so if you ask them a question about, did Jesus have brothers? They'd say, well, the Bible says he had four brothers. I forget their names. It's in Mark. It's Joseph, Simon, and two more. But Jesus has four brothers. That's that. Okay, that's Baptist. They have one authority. Let's try a different church. If you were to go up to a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox and ask them what has authority in your church, they would describe authority and it'd be something like this. Authority is the words of Jesus in the Bible and the words of Jesus as passed down through the disciples. And who are the modern day equivalents of the disciples? The bishops, right? And so for a Catholic, if you ask them about authority, they would say half of it is the words of Jesus that are written down, half of it are the words of Jesus that are passed down through the tradition of the church. So if you ask a Catholic or an Eastern Orthodox, did Jesus have brothers they would say, well, the Bible says he had four. The tradition of the church is that uh, Joseph was an older man when he got married to Mary, and that he had had a wife before, before who had died, and he, had, he married Mary so that she could watch over the, the boys now that their mama was gone. And so, if you at, a Catholic would say, those four brothers, they're not half-brothers, they're step-brothers, because Joseph was older. And so, if that's what, and then you can imagine the Catholic and the Baptist having this conversation, and the Baptist would say, but the Bible says they're four brothers. And the Catholic would say, but the tradition says that they're, they're, ha they're stepbrothers, they're not half-brothers. And the Baptist gets angry because you're talking about something other than the Bible, and the Catholic feels angry because you're disrespecting the bishops. You can see how far that argument's going to go, right? Not going to go very far. Let's try another church. Anglicans and Methodists. Bible, right? Bible is the basis for everything we talk about. Tradition, and then reason and experience, right? We have our reason, we have our experience, and we're, we're going to think through what we, we believe about something. And so if you ask a Methodist or an Anglican about this question, first they'd say, Mark says that there are four brothers. Here are their names. The tradition is mixed. Some parts of the tradition say that... Um, they're stepbrothers. Some people say that they're half-brothers. 
let's talk, let's be reasonable about let this, let's talk about this. Is this something that's essential for salvation? No. It is not essential to salvation to be able to argue about whether Jesus, what type of brothers Jesus had. So, what we'd say as Methodists is, the Bible says he has brothers, the tradition says one thing, we're not going to get all that worried about because it's not essential. They're probably step -bro half-brothers, they might be step-brothers, who, who cares? Relax. Let's go have a potluck. That'd be the Methodist response, right? I can take these blocks, Bible, tradition, and reason, and I can explain pretty much every church split that has happened across the centuries, right? It, it's not just that we disagree about how to use the Bible, it's we disagree about, is it the Bible that's authoritative, tradition, reason, how do these fit together? That's why churches split. You ever have those discussions with someone and you're trying to make a point and it's like they're talking another language? Different assumptions, different understandings about what matters, what's authority. So, that's, uh, and that's just like a simple question. Did Jesus have brothers? You get into the hard questions. What is, is baptism necessary for salvation? Uh, can you be rebaptized? What, what's happening here at communion? When Jesus says, this is my body, what does is mean? All right, what, what's that mean? What's the relationship between church and state? Is the law of Moses still binding on Christians today? Right, those are all the questions that, that we just are going to struggle about because we put the blocks together differently. So I told you I'd tell you the two reasons that uh, Christians argue and churches split. That was the long reason. Here's the short reason. We're sinners. Right? We're sinners. We are all capable of being self-centered, arrogant, paying attention to our own problems and no one else's. Right? We are entirely capable uh, of just not wanting to see anyone else uh, as doing any good. We, saw the, we see this in, in that very short reading we read about... Um, this is like the first church spat that happens. The disciples come up to Jesus and they say, they're casting out demons in, in your name. They're healing people in your name. Can you make them stop it? They're not a member of this church. Can you make them stop it? And what does Jesus say? Relax. Lay off. If they're healing people, you let them do their thing. Right? We have been arguing about the different types of Christians since, the very, since there were only 12 Christians, the first 12 disciples following Jesus. Right? So we have been arguing about who is better than who. We've been playing a zero-sum game as Christians. Are, are you all familiar with that term, zero-sum game? For one person to win, another person has to lose, and then it adds up to zero. So politics, sports, they're all zero-sum games, right? And, and we try to, we, we play that as a church. We play it as a church for if another church to do good, that means we're doing bad. And if we're doing good, I mean, if, I make a, if we make a disciple here, that, that's taking away something from someone else. I mean, we're trying, to, for me to get ahead, someone else has to be pushed down, pushed behind. And so that's the, the, what we play as a church. My way or the highway is my way for, for me to win. You got to lose. And so that's, that's what sin looks like as, we, as a churches argue and, and have these spats. Now what are we going to do about this? Are we going to be able to resolve uh, the, the differences between the church and one worship service? No. We're, I mean, we're, we're doing good just to get our minds around them, right? And we're not going to give up on it ever getting better, but I don't think it's going to get better today. And so I think the first thing we do is understand that if you're talking to a Baptist, Disciples of Christ, Church of Christ, Bible Church, if you're talking to anyone from one of those churches, if the sentence doesn't begin with, it says in the Bible, it, then it doesn't matter, right? You can say tradition, authority, reason, experience, doesn't matter. Unless you start with, as it says in the Bible, they just aren't going to be convinced. And from the, on the opposite side, if you're going to talk to a Catholic who says that the... Uh, the uh, Virgin Mary was ever virgin, born without the taint of original sin, did not die, but was assumed into heaven. If you say anything, up, I mean, you, you can't say that's not in the Bible because Catholic doesn't care. The Pope said so. 1852, that's that. The Pope said so. Done. Right? You can't argue someone out of that because that's how the authority works. And so first we understand that different churches have different understandings of authority, and we've got to respect that. We've got to respect that. Different understandings of authority... That's just how they roll, right? Second is to understand those differences and begin to be able to celebrate them. Thank God for the Baptist commitment to Scripture. Thank God for the richest, richness of Catholic tradition. Thank God for the exuberance of an Assembly of God worship service. Thank God for the Lutheran focus on salvation as a gift. Other churches are not problems to solve, but other branches of the family to learn to appreciate. Each part of the body is different, but heck, that's true of our bodies, that's true of the body of Christ. And these differences are good. 
They are very good. Finally, we understand, we are able to appreciate other ones, and then we are able to repent of our own contribution to the division between the churches. I personally don't think I have been the cause of any divisiveness between churches. I hope not. Uh, but i got to admit that there are moments where I have not been the peacemaker I could have been in this church and in other churches. There are times when we have been less than uh, searching for the unity of Jesus Christ. All right. So, we believe that in the end, God is going to make all things new. And that includes the church. It will be made whole and complete. I don't think we're going to show up in the kingdom of God and find out that this denomination was right and everyone else was wrong. I think we're going to show up and find out that every tradition was beautiful in its own way. And we'll finally be able to see and appreciate how. Amen. We come to a time when...